So I'm LaShawn Jefferson. I'm the Senior Executive Director of Perry World House Pins Hub for Global Engagement. And as always, really, really, really happy to see you here. Thanks for joining us for our final keynote program of the 2022 Global Order Colloquium, From Global to Local, A More Prosperous World. This afternoon's conversation deepens the focus of this year's colloquium, the theme of which is a fracturing world, the future of globalization. Yesterday, we had the good fortune to host former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull in conversation with Penn's Dr. Michael Mann on Australia's leadership in climate policy. Earlier today, we had an engaging roundtable discussion on the fractured economic order and how their regions and countries are responding with ambassadors to the US from Singapore, the African Union, and Uruguay. This afternoon's program will focus on the future of globalization and the challenges that countries will face as they decide how to move forward. Global trade and supply chains have dominated the world economy for decades, but the pandemic exposed and exacerbated their fragility. Shortages of essential goods from semiconductors, chips to foodstuffs were felt around the world. This discussion will examine possibilities for a path forward. Can and should previous models of globalization be reclaimed? How will the world need to adapt? Does this fracturing, in fact, provide an opportunity for reimagining? It's my honor to welcome to Perry World House, Rana Forahar and Wharton Dean Erica James, who will be moderating today's conversation. Rana is the global business columnist and an associate editor at the, editor at the Financial Times. She's also CNN's global economic analyst. She's the author of several books, including the upcoming book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, which will be published later this fall, so look out for it on Amazon. In 2019, she was awarded a Society for Advancing Business Editing and Writing Award for her tech and policy coverage at the Financial Times. Prior to joining the Financial Times and CNN, she spent six years at Time as an assistant managing editor and economic columnist. Dr. Erica James became the Dean of the Wharton School on July 1, 2020. Trained uh, as an organizational psychologist, Dean James is a leading expert on crisis leadership, workplace diversity, and management strategy. Prior to her appointment at the Wharton School, Dean James was uh, the John H. Harlan Dean at Emory's Business School. An award-winning educator, accomplished consultant, and researcher, she is the first woman and the first person of color to be appointed Dean in Wharton's 141 year history. I'm sure she will appreciate that. <laughs> She's right out of earshot. As such, she has paved the way for women in leadership, both in education and in corporate America. It gives me great pleasure to welcome both of them to the stage. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. I feel like my mom writes these introductions, you know, <laughs> it's always a little longer than you want. Um, thank you, Dean, for having me here. And um, thanks to all of you for being here for this conversation. Um, I'm going to just scene set for about five minutes or so um, my thoughts on the topic of deglobalization, which has suddenly become the topic du jour for, <laughs> for all sorts of reasons um, that, that we all know. Um, Deglobalization, and in particular, the sort of philosophy that underlies the last half century of globalization, and I would call that the neoliberal economic philosophy, is something that I've thought a lot about actually since my first book, Makers and Takers, which looked at the divide between Wall Street and Main Street and why our financial system um, wasn't working as Adam Smith thinks it probably or thought probably, probably it should. Um, but I think the last few years, um, from the financial crisis to the pandemic to war in Ukraine, have been a bit like a scrim that has been pulled up on the vulnerabilities of our existing system. Um, and in particular, the kind of globalization that we've seen. So how would I define that? Um, neoliberal globalization, I would define as the IMF does, um, which is the assumption that there will be a globally free movement of capital, goods and people to wherever it is most productive. The assumption is that A, those things can move across borders and that B, that movement will always end up in a kind of a win-win, right? Um, you know, the world is flat, right? I'm referring to the Tom Friedman book from 2005, which was actually written at the apex um, of what I would say is conventional modern globalization. 
Uh, between 2003 and 2007, you saw the global economy as a whole grow faster than it ever has. A lot of good reasons for that, which we can tease out. But within countries and within almost all countries, you had big areas, big regions of hollowing out. And so even though the planet as a whole, the global economy grew faster than ever before, you also had in-country inequality growing very, very quickly. And that has, to my mind, led to some of the polarized politics that we've seen not only in the US, but in many rich countries, um, nationalism in you know, emerging markets, all of the sort of fractures that I know you all have been talking about for, for the last few sessions. So I believe we are at a pendulum shift now. And this is appropriate because political philosophies and economic philosophies are always suited to their time until they aren't. So if you look at everything from 18th century mercantilism, which gave way to laissez-faire, um, uh, laissez-faire giving way eventually to Keynesianism, to this latest round of neoliberalism, which interestingly, I would, uh, you know, many people would peg it at the Reagan-Thatcher revolution. I would actually put the starting point in the 1930s at a period that was quite like our own when the world was in conflict. Um, countries were trying to figure out how they could come together and avert war. And neoliberalism and the idea that you could knit together a global business community and global capital, capital in order to reduce conflict was the way they found. Unfortunately, I would argue now that capital has moved way too far ahead of goods and certainly labor and workers. And that's what we have to fix now. That's, that's what needs to be tweaked in the system. And some of the challenges and bumps that we're seeing are completely connected to that idea. But there's also a lot of upside, not just for the US, but for many other countries. Um, and this is what I get at in my book. And so I'll stop there, just sort of scene setting and be happy to, to take it with you from here. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction. So for those of you who weren't in the green room with us before we came out, uh, we were talking about the fact that we both have children in college. And I think often about what world our kids will be inheriting. And in the context of globalization and deglobalization, what do you see for the future of that generation? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I think you have to start with the idea that we are at what I believe is going to be probably a generational economic pendulum shift. And we are really at the beginning of that. You might put the financial crisis of 2008 as the point at which the pendulum started to shift. But now it's sort of reached this uh, level where we can all feel it. So we've got decades to go before we know where things are going to land. But one thing that I think you can see is on both sides of the political spectrum, um, you have a sense that the interests of national economies, and in particular the interests of labor in national economies, which in the US, it's sort of a shocking number, but labor, workers, everybody get only 14% of the economic pie in this country. And most of that is going to people like you and me. Um, so that, that's not a lot to be duking it out for. And I think that you can see how both uh, sides of the political aisle have capitalized on this legitimate um, concern about that balance of power between capital and labor. So what I see is on the downside, um, a lot of all against all Hobbesian politics, but on the upside, a much richer conversation about what should the sharing of the pie look like? You know, what should, as we move to an economy that, you know, is going to need to be more resilient, possibly less efficient, and by efficient, I mean sort of just in time globalized supply chains. Um, we're moving into a world where we realize that there is a politics in the political economy. Um, we're moving into a world in which a younger generation of, of workers, not only are they coming into a, uh, a labor market that has been structurally depressed, and that always results in a lower um, lifetime, lifetime earning, but they're moving into a world in which they don't have any assets to protect. And so I see that as being a really big political shift coming. I would not be surprised, for example, uh, if you started to see some uh, much more, um, how should I put it, stronger and more forceful conversations about, about labor rights. We're already seeing the resurgence of a, you know, a union movement. Um, you're gonna start to see the price of goods really being put in human terms. 
okay, is cheap cheap? Or it, once you tally in the cost of carbon and the cost of small fingers somewhere that might be making products and you don't know about it, what, it, what really is the cost of a product? So these are the things that I think are going to be in the conversation. Well, I think there already are being a part of, um, as a part of Penn's campus where I'm surrounded by young people, they're coming into our classroom talking about these issues and already have a level of trepidation about the future for them. And so Indeed. How, how can we help them navigate that? So they're not yet in the labor force, yeah. but they're already anticipating the stress that they yeah. will experience when they do. Yeah, so um, I would separate that question maybe into two parts and let me let me answer it in two ways i think that there is a deep social question there which is um are we consumers or are we citizens <laughs> and i think that that is a profound question um we've had 40 years of being consumers and our entire uh, economic policy has been run around that everything from labor rights to corporate monopoly and antitrust policy to the way the SEC thinks about issues. I mean, and we're now seeing a Biden administration that is pushing back against all of that and really making quite a pivot in a way that I think has been dramatically underreported. You know, if you look back to um, the executive order that the president signed in July of 2021, saying, guess what? It's not all about consumers anymore. It's about citizens and it's about stakeholders. It's about communities. Um, it's about a better balance between public and private across every agency and go, go SEC, uh, go FTC, go, go all the different agencies of the federal government and make that work. That's a big deal. And you're, you know, you're starting to see real action there. But then in terms of the more personal or micro aspect to this question, um, you have to look at whether this new paradigm of, I'll use the word deglobalization, but really it's more, I would say, regionalization and localization. Is that going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be different? Well, let me, let me pose a real world example. Uh, one thing that we all know happened after the pandemic is work from home became a real thing. So I don't know what it's like at Penn, but at the Financial Times where I work, we will never go back to five days a week. It will only ever in every single office be three days. And that's kind of only if you want. Um, for all kinds of reasons. Now, not every company or, or, or uh, organization can do that or should, but that's a big shift. And it's been really great for a lot of people. It's enabled folks to live in places that are more affordable. It's um, reduced carbon emissions. I and mean, there, there are a lot of things that you can look at and say, this is great. This allows for a, a new kind of localization um, and spreading and dispersion of economic wealth. At the same time, I was in um, the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos this past uh, May, and a CEO said something really interesting to me. He said, um, you know, I think this work from home thing seems great right now, but if you can do it in Tahoe, you can do it in India. And that was very interesting to me. And he said that he thought the tech companies in particular were pushing this as the way forward to a new period of white collar outsourcing which will be a win for some countries and will i suspect cause some political pressures in others fascinating so you're in a university context right now and the core of our mission is generally research so i'm curious what was the underlying research that got you to your insights and conclusions and how did you come with these ideas and what did the data tell you that's so fascinating. such an interesting question um so as many folks here, I spend a lot of time looking at data and talking about data, but in some ways, it's more the felt experience that informed my book. And, and let me give you an example of, of what I mean. Um, just full disclosure, so um, my dad is an immigrant from Turkey. He came to be educated in the US and then started a manufacturing business in the Midwest. Uh, so I grew up, I'm 52, I grew up in the 80s and really sort of lived um, the re reality on the ground of neoliberal economic policy, which meant, again, wealth as a whole, both for the US and for the world, but major hollowing out of certain parts of the Rust Belt, you know, different swing states. We can, we can all, you know, I think, in particularly here at, at Penn, understand what that's all about. Um, so I always had a sense that, you know, this Ricardian 
trade theory sounds good, but there are real people connected to the policy decisions being made. And when I was working on my first book, I had an interview, um, which I will stick with me forever, with the former AFL-CIO president, uh, Richard Trumpka, who's now passed. And I asked him, what were the conversations like for you guys when we, uh, the US was signing NAFTA and contemplating um, China and the WTO? And he said, well, he'd had some really interesting conversations with policymakers, um, one of which had told him, look, we know this is going to hit labor, not just in the US, but in many rich countries, really hard. But then there's going to be a leveling out or a leveling up where um, globally wages will start to rise. And you know, you've already seen that. Chinese wages have risen tremendously, certain emerging markets, and that's been a lifting of boats. And it's also changed PS supply chains. I mean, even before the current um, uh, trade conflicts, there was already um, a rethinking in many industries of complicated supply chains, particularly for low margin products, because it just didn't make sense with rising wages in Asia to transport certain things. So let's set that aside. So I asked Trump and he said, well, you know, we were told there'll be this leveling up. But then I asked the policymaker, he says to me, you know, well, how long is that going to take? And he said he was told three to five generations. And that, that's the rub. That's the rub. The leveling out doesn't happen the same everywhere. And it does, this is the, you know, I could say this for the UK, I could say it for France, I could say it for Germany. I could even say it, interestingly, for China and many other emerging markets where, again, um, there is a political in the political economy. And, and growth isn't just about numbers on the paper, it's about choices. If, if I may just give you one other telling um, example, um, because I think it's important to see it from the other side. I've been traveling to China for you know 25 years, and I always thought that American policymakers and CEOs of multinational companies were being a little bit naive to think that this huge, vibrant, um, formerly globally ascendant country was going to simply, you know, make its way into the existing system without kind of tweaking it for its for its own purposes. And um, I had a conversation once, uh, it's probably about 15 years ago, I was interviewing the CEO of a large um, European wind company that happened to be in the number one slot in its in its uh, area and its sector in China at the time. And I asked this guy, I said, so how's business? you know how are things going what's your growth going to be like he's like things are great i think you know in five years we're probably going to be in the number four position and i was like wow okay well a how do you know that so precisely and b why is it good that you're falling from number one to number four and he said well that's what beijing has told us is going to happen and yeah different political economy place matters place matters and i think that countries are beginning to rethink for good reasons and for problematic reasons, um, the balance between national interest and the global economy. I'm, I'm fascinated by these stories and, and um, I wanna ask, as we move forward, we all have been in this country when we have been sort of deemed the winners in globalization. Looking ahead, who do you see, which countries do you see being the winners going forward? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, I'd be arrogant if I said I could answer that, you know, 100%. But but what I will say is, right now there's a lot of anxiety, and it's funny. I feel this with my colleagues at the FT who are in the UK, and the UK is in a really tough position. I think it's tough at the moment um, to be a small country that does not have a strong regional alliance, and so Brexit was just a disaster for the UK. On the other hand, being a smaller country within um, a, a series of regional alliances that can be leveraged could be very interesting. And let me give you an example. I think that Africa is actually poised to do surprisingly well in this new world for a lot of reasons. One of which is that you're going to have the big the dual powers. Let's say, you know, the U.S. will have one sphere of interest or, or U.S., Europe and certain OECD nations will have one sphere of influence, China and a number of uh, its allies and a number of Asian countries that are in that geography will have a sphere of interest. And then Africa and Latin America and certain other parts of the world are going to be sort of figuring out, OK, what works best for us? Um, who are we going to ally with um, in which areas? And at the same time, I see in Africa and Latin America new regional alliances that are happening.
and and there's a leapfrogging, particularly because we, we haven't talked about the effects of technological disruption, but at the same time, all the geopolitics are changing. You've also got this huge technological tailwind where everything that we've seen in the consumer internet is right now coming to business. So internet of things, decentralized technologies like additive manufacturing, which is gonna be a massive disruptor. And when I say additive manufacturing, I'm talking about 3D printing, things that used to be for hobbyists, you can now 3D print a house in six days. Um, they're selling them in Austin for $250,000 in case anybody's interested. You know, I mean, this has come on tremendously. So there's this technological tailwind. And, and um, typically, we saw this with wireless in places like Africa. Countries that actually didn't have the old infrastructure are poised to jump and create new standards, new alliances. And so I think you could actually see some small countries doing well. I will also say um, in the sort of um, bipolar one world, two systems paradigm of US and China, which is, this is the big conflict that we hear about or the big sort of dual paradigm system. I'm not gonna necessarily place a bet on who's going to win, but I will say that trust is going to be huge um, and trust in currency, trust in partnerships, trust in standards, whoever can, and by the way, and trust in governance and the ability of the political system to curb elites and keep them in check and deal with corruption, that's gonna be the battlefield on which all this is won. So I wanna stay with that because I have great interest in interpersonal trust in my own research, but you're talking about trust at a macro level. It feels to me that we have very limited trust right now in any of those systems you just described. So how do you, at a macro level, rebuild or regain trust? Such a great question. Um, let me talk a little bit about the financial system. It's something that's really on my mind right now. Um, because again, I, I have always thought that in an ideal world, you wouldn't have a single global reserve currency and the dollar holding that position solely. I mean. Keynes didn't want a single global reserve currency. There was always going to be an imbalance in that system. Ideally, you would have a kind of a basket currency or you'd have a more multipolar system. So um, right now you have China saying, uh, and many countries actually, particularly post Russia sanctions, which I totally supported, um, saying, okay, the dollar can be weaponized. So let's think about where we want our financial security to lie. And so you're gonna see more regional trade being done, say in RMB, um, that's, that's quite natural. But in order to get, China is now going to have to try and get um, other countries to want to use the RMB, aside from say Russia or um, commodity rich nations in Africa or, or Latin America that are already doing trade in RMB. You're gonna have to convince everybody that, hey, even though um, this is an autocratic government that is run potentially by someone who's trying to make himself a you know, leader for life, you should come along with us. That's about trust. On the flip side, America and our government is going to have to convince everybody that, you know what, we've got these really structurally difficult um, debt issues uh, and we may be moving into a world where the US dollar position is changing. Here's how we're gonna deal with it. Here's, here's how we're going to invest and grow and also curb what needs to be curbed at the same time. That's the trust debate here, which is really, again, about the political economy. See, I, I keep getting back to politics as opposed to economics, but I think that, that that balance is so important now. We're gonna see a lot more political in the political economy. So everywhere in the world, at some point in time, there is a war happening. And right now, our attention is focused on the Ukraine-Russia war. How do you see that impacting what you're thinking about in terms of globalization or deglobalization? So I'd speak first about what it's um, doing to Europe, which is really focusing the continent on regionalization and on more regional security. I think um, what you've seen happen in Germany is, is really quite stunning. Um, uh, and, and that's a big deal for a country that had been sort of trying to hedge its bets around security, but also around economic leadership in the region for, for some period. So uh, I think it has definitely pushed the world towards a bipolar, if not tripolar paradigm. Um, I think it's also provided some interesting case studies in 
okay, if we're gonna rejigger this just-in-time world of supply chains that are quick and highly efficient, but possibly not resilient, in this case around energy or food, what's the cost of that? How quickly can it be done? What does it take? You know, this is uh, where you start to hear words like friend shoring, which came up um, in an interview I did with, with Janet Yellen at the Atlantic Council, which was fascinating. Um, you start to see how quickly can supply chains uh, be tweaked? Where do you need more resiliency? The conversation about chips, the conversation about Taiwan, very much coming off the back of what's happened in Ukraine and Russia. So I wanna switch gears a little bit. And again, harken back to the fact that we're on a college campus. What do you see as the role of educational institutions in the work that you do? Well, that's a great question too. I actually have a lot about education in my book because um, one of the things that I think all countries are going to have to struggle with, um, particularly in the Anglo-American model, is starting to look at labor as an asset on the balance sheet and not just a cost. You know, I, I think one of the, the really problematic aspects of our capitalism has been that the shareholder value theory, the Chicago theory, and I have a daughter at Chicago, so <laughs> nothing against Chicago, but um, uh, the, the Friedman-esque neoliberal model of the world was all about lowering prices, right, for consumers. But what is cheap is, you know, is cheap really cheap when you're looking at a global pandemic that hits and then you cannot produce basic goods in your country that you need, um, you start to question these things. When you have a world in which most value is gonna live in the future in intellectual property, in ideas, maybe we should start thinking about labor and how we train people and skill people as a nation, but also within the private sector a little differently than we do now. So I wanna pick up on that because there is a growing conversation around the role of uh, institutions like Penn that are perceived to uh, develop leadership in an elite class within a particular country. And we're developing them for broader strategic objectives, not necessarily tactical, you know, hand, foot, feet on the ground, work that might, or skills that might be needed in a particular economy. So. Should we, the pens of the world, be thinking about how we're developing our students or the skills that we're developing? That's interesting. I mean, I think one of the things you're getting at is that if you look at the top 10 or 20 American universities, um, you're essentially catering to a global meritocracy that does brain work. And I'm reminded of um, the, the British um, public intellectual, David Goodhart, who wrote a book called Head, Heart, Hands. And he argued, and, and I would agree with this, that we've put a lot of emphasis on head. We haven't put nearly as much emphasis on heart and hands. Um, and I would put heart, especially at the top of that list. So can you say more about what you mean by the heart? Yeah, I'm talking about EQ. I'm talking about high touch, collaborative human skill sets, things that cannot be done by the software or by the robots. And so I think that we definitely need a rebalancing of, of value. And we saw this during the pandemic. Who's an essential worker? Are we treating essential workers well? Um, I was really struck actually by this wonderful New York Times piece. I think it was a French front page piece recently about how AI was um, monitoring and controlling the workflow of a lot of different um, types of laborers, many in the caring industries. Mm -hmm. You know, people that are working with the bereaved, nurses, and they're essentially being um, siloed and tracked by these very linear metrics into doing things that are really not their job, you know, not, not about their job. They're doing their job in a way that's, that's worse because they're being looked at in this highly linear way. And um, so, yeah, I think the jobs of the future are gonna require definitely some tech skills, but a lot of collaborative skills, a lot of how do I deal with other human beings in groups? And so I think I see that as heart work. And the, and the handwork 
is hand work is you know it's it's about labor it's about you know a lot of the jobs um that that require human labor let's face it they are going to be um done by machines in the future i can already see that i'm i'm very familiar with industry and manufacturing because i grew up on factory floors and you know i can tell you you walk into a factory floor today high-tech additive manufacturing facility there's about three people and they may be let's say you know, blue collar workers, but they will be highly technically trained uh, folks that are dealing with machinery and robots. They're not using their hands to put things down in a, an assembly line in a dirty factory. And so I see an opportunity actually to, um, and I think universities of all kinds, um, community colleges, secondary schools could play a role in this to knit together industry and service, which any of us that have worked in business know that they're already way more knitted together uh, than the statistics would would of uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics would would lead you to think. But they're going to be ever more knitted together. I mean, here, here's just one example: um, smart uh, smart devices of all kinds. There is going to be a chip in everything from your shoes. In fact, there probably is in some people's sneakers already to our tires. So a company like Goodyear that's making tires is also collecting data, which could then become, um, you know, spun off into any number of other businesses. How about training the workers who are on the line to think about data and data ethics and, you know, what, what those other service businesses might leave? And this, is, this could be a golden age if we get it right. So you mentioned brain work, heart work, and hand work. Head, hand, heart. Head, yes. <laughs> So what about land work? And by that, I mean the agricultural economy and what's happening there and the shifts that are happening maybe because of climate change and how we're able or not able to produce different things, the movement towards plant-based foods. How does that factor into um, our ability to feed the world? Or Yeah, well, it, I'm glad you asked about agriculture because that actually kind of pulls together a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, I was struck, I'm sure as many of you were in the pandemic, Okay, it hits, suddenly restaurants are empty, everybody's lining up at the grocery store, there are supply shortages, but there are all these empty restaurants. How, how could that happen? Isn't there some like net imbalance there? Well, the answer is that there are two totally separate supply chains, utterly siloed, one going to restaurants, one going to supermarkets, most of it owned by about four companies. And that's efficient when there's nothing bad happening, but it's not particularly resilient. Add into that the disruptions from climate change, um, which are, are simply changing the nature of what can grow where. Um, you know, I have British colleagues that are uh, living in land that is probably gonna grow champagne in the future because the, you know, climate change is moving, um, moving growing seasons. Um, add into that conflict, like what we've seen in Ukraine, where Europe's breadbasket literally gets taken off the market in, in a series of days. And you have policymakers and companies starting to think about highly decentralized solutions. So things like, for example, vertical farming, where you could have um, a farm literally growing off this wall. You know, these are starting to to be put up in, in corporate campuses. Google feeds its entire workforce in California this way. Um, lots of companies, universities, communities that are potentially even food deserts are gonna be able to use those technologies. Um, you're gonna see um, all kinds of regionalization. I think antitrust is gonna play an issue here where you're gonna start to see some public support for more diversified food systems. So those are, those are some things that are happening and not just in the US, but again, everywhere. So you mentioned earlier that you, and let me just remind the audience that there is an opportunity in a few minutes for Q&A. So if our conversation has sparked any questions for you, please feel, start to prepare your questions because we're gonna be coming to you shortly. Uh, the rise in populism and populist leaders and it feels as if there is growing criticism or antagonism around populist leaders in many respects, or they're, they're, uh, people pay attention to them in a way that we've not really paid attention to leaders who were considered less populist. Why do you think that is? And what do you see that changing at any point? Yeah, my view on populism, um, globally actually kind of goes back to my view on the economic pendulum shift that we've been talking about because i think what happened is 
and I'll just take the US as an example, but you could layer this onto other countries, particularly in Europe. Um, you had a left that adopted actually many of the economic policies of the right. Um, you know, I, I would argue, particularly around trade, you know, some of the um, deregulation of financial markets um, and deregulation of corporations that happened during the Reagan-Thatcher Reagan era, which kind of unleashed global capital, that whole paradigm happened in trade under the Clinton and even under the Obama administrations. And, you know, again, there's a lot of wealth that's been created, but I think that there was a, a sense um, amongst working people from, from both sides of the aisle that, well, wait a minute, which party is looking after labor now? Um, and so that to me created the opportunity for, um, I don't, you know, I'll just say a certain kind of American fascism, you know, that we've seen on the right. Um, but I think it also created a sense, um, a, a push on the far left to say, well, wait a minute, we really need to, to swing back towards labor. And so you've got um, populism on both sides of the aisle. You could say the same thing in France and the UK. And there is a sense, again, of this pendulum shift and the balance between capital and labor that has gone so far towards capital, even amongst um, groups of people that are supposed to represent labor, that populism is, to me, a natural, natural result of that. So in the last couple of years, we've seen really significant impacts by the supply chain issues. I, you have cars that are pre-owned cars that are costing as much, if not more, than new cars. Uh, we had the really scary baby food shortage in the U.S. recently. How do you see that circling back and, and addressing itself? Yeah. Um, let me address the, the issue of inflation first, because I think that that is an underexplored component of deglobalization. Um, and it's frankly, it's something <laughs> that nobody really wants to land on. It's sort of an uncomfortable, inconvenient truth. Um, the system that we had for the last 50 years was designed to drive down prices for consumers. Now, one of the problems is that even though, t I'm gonna just make a blanket statement, even though TVs and Walmart got a lot cheaper, the, the things that make you middle class, education, housing, healthcare, got a lot more expensive. So those things were all rising at about three times the level of core inflation, even before the pandemic in Ukraine raised inflation rates, and they are still rising at a higher level. So those lower prices didn't make up for stagnating wages and a exponentially high level of inflation in the things we need to be middle class. So that's problem number one. All right, now you throw on top of that supply chain issues, which of course are going to add to inflation because it creates um, you know, blockages and friction in the system. So there's actually an interesting policy conversation going on in Washington right now. A lot of people are saying, well, gosh, you know, we, we should um, go back to the old system. You know, we should, we should lift tariffs. We should go back to using consumer welfare and in particular lowering prices as the sort of key metric of are things good? Is the economy working? I would argue we cannot go back wholesale to the old approach because that doesn't help the fact that all the things we need to be middle class are getting more expensive. And that requires a more of a whole, whole of government um, paradigm shift really to a post neoliberal world. So I'm gonna ask my last question and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. If there's one thing that you would want us to take away from your comments today, what would that be? I think it would be that um, even though our system of globalization, neoliberal globalization in particular, has created a, a lot of wealth in the last 40 or 50 years, we also have a global economy that has run so far ahead of national politics that there are fractures in the system. And so I think we have to think a little bit more, no matter where we are, at a community level, at a state level, at a country level, about localism in order to save what's best about globalism. You know, of course we all want people and goods and ideas and data to flow across borders, but there can't be a sense, and, and the data does support this, that 
a small group of people that are the highest level asset owners and sit in the C-suite of multinational companies are so disproportionately benefiting from the system. There has to be a sense that um, there are a greater number of stakeholders here that are benefiting. Thank you. Thank you for such great questions. All right, let's go to the audience and I believe they might want you to move to the microphone. Uh, you've talked a lot about <clears throat> regionalization, supply chains, and a lot about technology. Uh, one country, Taiwan, in a, it's in a very interesting position with China, manufactures nearly every uh, chip that we use in the world. So can you talk a bit about the effort by not just the Biden administration, but Europe to redevelop their own uh, semiconductor manufacturing industries? And is that realistic? And if a war were to happen over Taiwan, what effect would that have for the rest of the world? Yeah, that's that's kind of the question at the moment, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so you're right. 92% um, uh, of the world's high-end semiconductors are made in Taiwan, which is kind of incredible if you think about it. I mean, if you think about just, just that fact that we have had such trust in the ability of our system to cope with almost anything from a climate disaster to geopolitical conflict um, that we've placed 92 percent of essentially the lifeblood of the digital economy in one highly contested country so you know everybody has in the last year or so woken up to the fact that maybe you want a little more resiliency in the system and I would put aside the the pol even you know whatever you think about the politics between the U.S. and China on this, it strikes me that you wouldn't want 92% of chips to be made in any one place, be it Brussels or Toronto or Lagos. I mean, you know, so resiliency and redundancy is, I think, going to become much more important. I um, uh, there's a, a a gentleman named Barry Lynn um, who wrote a really wonderful book called The End of the Line, which is like the book about supply chains. He actually wrote it the same year that um, Tom Friedman wrote the, the World is Flat. And he had an entirely different takeaway. It was right after the tsunami in Asia that disrupted um, supply chains there. And he thought, oh my gosh, it's like we can see suddenly how fragile these are. And um, he argues for a rule of four where there should be in very critical areas like semiconductors or um, medical supplies, food systems, energy systems, that there should be um, at least four big suppliers, four geographies. You just want to create a little bit more resilience and redundancy in the system. Now, semiconductors, unfortunately, you know, it takes a while. It takes 10 years for a foundry to be built and, and ramp up to steam. So I think that we are going to see in real time, potentially in the next five years, what it will mean if there is a major conflict in in and around Taiwan and, and what that's going to do for supply chains. By the way, I think U.S. policymakers have really gotten ahead of their skis on this because there's a lot of talk right now um, that is very provocative. Um, you know, we're sort of stumbling into conflict without an industrial strategy, without a, a fully fledged industrial policy. And I think that's dangerous. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm Daniel Hoffman from Philadelphia Ethical Society. And I must say, I really wish you were on that earlier panel. Okay. They, they could have used you. I missed uh, the panel. I don't know what that one was about. Um, so. Well, they were definitely of a certain point of view that um, you don't share about <laughs> globalization. Anyway, I, I Googled you, and um, on Goodreads, there are 27 really lovely quotes, and I think it should be 28, because your comment about we're being treated as consumers when we really need to be treated as citizens is a good one. Unfortunately, there's a reinforcement mechanism for treating us as a consumer. You get paid to do that. Nobody's getting paid to treat us as citizens. And it, it's sort of was almost a case of the fallacy of the commons that's operating there. And I, I know this is unfair to do to you, but I'd really like to hear you talk about how we could change that and prioritize and better reward citizenship. Um, that's, a, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm happy to give my, my thoughts. I have two thoughts. Um, one is a 
very basic practical thing. I think we need a year of service in this country. I, I really do. And just please write to your legislators, tweet it, talk about it. We need to get out and do something aside from work for money. We need to work for each other. We need to work for the country. You know, to me, that would be to go back to the point about populism, what would be the single biggest way to get rid of populism? Work together in different groups, <laughs> diverse groups around a common goal. And you could just think of so many things that you could do in your individual community. Um, so that's point number one. But let me be a little bit optimistic and say that one positive tailwind I see here to changing this notion of consumerism as the end all be all is that the labor markets themselves are changing and demographics are changing in such a way that what is the fastest growing um, category of jobs in this country and frankly in most countries care jobs health care jobs education child care these jobs just by their very nature force you to think about ethics force you to think about you know people not just um, products and um so I find that to be a, a hopeful thing. It's also interestingly, we'll, we'll uh, argue for more localization in labor markets everywhere because these are jobs with the exception of certain things, you know, you can outsource radiology or whatever. You can't outsource high touch um, care jobs. Those will be done locally. And perhaps at some point we will compensate those caregivers yes, appropriately. appropriately. And guess what? We will because there's the labor market is going to force it because there's going to be so much need. And you're already seeing this in nursing. Nursing wages are going up. That's true. All right, we have a question. I'm going to get to you in just a moment, but we have a question coming in from a, a Zoom listener. Can you discuss the very negative impact of the pandemic on the education of a very large number of students, particularly younger students and already disadvantaged students? in both this country and worldwide on the future global global labor and capital markets. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we probably have all read the statistics recently that have been coming in. We kind of knew it, felt it during the pandemic. I'm sure many of us, I had children at home who you know, were just not doing much, you know, frankly, online in education uh, during the pandemic. That was, of course, we know um, worst in, in poorer neighborhoods. And you're now seeing that in the reading scores that are coming out, which have seen the biggest drop in decades. So this is massive. I mean, this is this is a, a getting back to my point about labor and human. I don't even want to use the word human capital because I feel like that's a kind of a neoliberal, like, you know, it's like taking people and making them into products. Um, but but this notion that, you know, this is this is our major resource in a knowledge economy and we're failing. It's it's huge. That said, and, and I was talking with a, a colleague of yours about this, there's at the local level, there's all kinds of really interesting experiments going on right now with how to rejigger education. So college debt, obviously a huge issue. This is something the administration's t trying to take on. I expect, by the way, that we're gonna see a lot more debt jubilees going forward, particularly as younger progressives come into office. I just, the whole capital labor debt paradigm is so skewed. But if you look at economic history, there's no way it doesn't tilt back. It always does this every hundred years or so when things get too extreme. So I think at that point, you're going to see an even deeper conversation about we need education, but how should it best be delivered? Um, what is the combination of work and education that is viable? What is the combination of service and um, for profit that is viable? Um, you know, my own daughter actually went to a really interesting and innovative um, state high school in New York City that is associated with Bard College. And this school, you graduate not just with a high school degree, but with two years of college credit. And it's game changing. It's game changing. And these are spreading. They're in 20 different states now. Uh, President Obama actually lauded this model in his one of his last um, State of the Union addresses. So I see all kinds of ways in which this conversation is starting to shift. Companies, too, are doing things like bringing kids in for internships and, you know, as early as eighth grade, just 
part-time, 10, 10 hours a week. Cisco is a great example of this. Um, I was speaking at a Cisco event a few years ago, and oh, are you a Cisco person? Um, they, they do this wonderful program where you can go in as early as eighth grade, start to work, learn skills, and then you've got this leg up, and you can even have some of your education paid for at the same time that you're working. Many companies do this. IBM does it. Tech, tech businesses are, are very big into this, which then also goes to the fact that in technology, there's more of a willingness to look at skills as opposed to credentials, because there's a lot of kids that can code, you know, and I think you're going to see um, the companies and the state together coming coming together and creating some uniformity around around those types of things. That's awesome. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Kanchi. I'm a graduate student at Penn. And thank you so much for your insights and for your questions as well. Uh, and especially addressing climate change. Um, and with regards to your question on localization, is it going to be good, bad, or different? I think there's an active dialogue and shifts in agricultural production based on temperature increases um, and also which regions are more suitable or less suitable for growing certain crops. So how do you anticipate localization in developed countries playing a role in um, creating a more resilient global system with respect to developing countries? I know you mentioned a little bit about that, but I wanted to ask you in context of, say, first world versus third world countries. Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Let me give you a real world example. Um, and this one is in my book. Uh, there's a company, a vertical farm company that I tracked. And in fact, I've just finished um, an FT uh, film about, uh, in part about this company. So it'll be on the website and you can actually see it in a couple of weeks if you want. Um, it's called Plenty, and they do vertical farms. And the idea is that because of things like climate change, um, conflict, you know, whatever kind of disruption it is, you want to be able to not move the product, be it a berry or a vegetable or a grain, but you want to be able to move the entire growing system. This also plays into the idea of increasing urbanization in emerging, uh, in emerging markets in the developing world, where you are going to see still more people coming from rural areas into urban areas. And how are you going to feed all those people? Um, particularly when you start putting a price on a transport price on emissions and energy, which is coming everywhere. Um, I think at some point in the next 10 years, there's going to be almost like a nutritional label that will tell you the, ener the energy and emissions cost of a product. So, okay, so you want to be able to transfer the growing environment in the form of some kind of high-tech farm where growth can happen where wherever it is. Um, this is happening first in rich countries. Um, Walmart, for example, Albertsons have signed deals with this particular company, but also any number of others to start growing produce, fruits and vegetables, which tend to be the most um, vulnerable uh, because of the, 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 the way that they, their specialized needs for growth in, in areas where the consumption is. So, you know, you're now going to go to a Walmart or an Albertsons and when you buy your berries, they will not have been grown a thousand miles away and then transported with high energy costs and high emissions costs. They will be, have been grown maybe a stone's throw from where you're buying them. Decentralized technologies of all kinds, I believe, are going to be the industrial disruptors of our era. I think production and consumption is ultimately going to be hubbed much more closely together for environmental reasons, for labor reasons, and for uh, resiliency reasons. And that is coming. It's coming in industry. It's coming in housing. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Uh, thank you for a, a phenomenal talk so far. Um, Thanks. So I, I really appreciated what you were saying about uh, the head and heart and, and hands. And so I, I think something like that is, is probably, probably accurate. Um, so I, I'm really grateful for institutions like like Penn that focus primarily, um, but but not entirely on on the head. Um, and I also see pathways if I want to go learn uh, learn the hand side. Right? We have you mentioned community colleges, vocational schools. We have labor unions that that trade people. We have an, uh, apprentice pathways. Um, so I'm I'm really curious. What can any nation do? And if specificity is helpful, maybe what can the U.S. do? Uh, to increase our heart, right? What, what does the pen of EQ look like? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> That's a big question. I'm glad that came towards the end. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think 
valuing care jobs. I think valuing care. I mean, my mother's a teacher and um, she was a teacher for 35 years. She regularly spent her own money buying supplies for the kids. I mean, she would be patching things together with duct tape and taking in books. And, you know, I mean, we can talk till the cows come home about, yeah, that's terrible and that should change. But the market is going to change it. I really believe that's happening um, because the demand for new forms of education, more uh, broad-based education, um, the competitive disadvantage in, a, in what is still a global market of not having a 21st century workforce, that's eventually gonna change things. Now, how quickly does it change them? Does it change them with a lot of social and political strife? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but, but I do think that demographics are, are simply pushing us into a place, and you can already begin to see it a little bit where, um, I mean, this is really at the margins, but if you're looking for sort of vectoral um, data, working on Wall Street is not what it used to be quite, you know? You, I think you've reached an apex of financialization and we are moving to something different in terms of what we are going to value. Um, I would also just add one other thing. This is a little bit off your point, but we haven't touched on it. Um, data, data and how data gets governed and the data that comes from all of us. I mean, now I'm going into Shoshana Zuboff's territory with surveillance capitalism and I won't, I won't try and go there because she wrote the book on it literally, but, um, but I think that there is a very rich conversation that is going on about data and the dignity of human data and how it gets valued and how it gets tallied and who owns it that is also part of what you're talking about and part of kind of creating a new ethical conversation around labor in, a, in an age in which surveillance capitalism is the kind of capitalism that we're in. Well, as the dean of the world's largest business school, I can tell you that you're right. Uh, many of our students are not going into the finance field as, as much as they had been in the past. And it's now tech and it's now analytics that are leading the pathways in terms of where our students are going. So, you're right. Yes. Hi, my name is Dalia Marin. I'm coming from the Univers Technical University of Munich in Germany. And I wanted to say that I'm a bit skeptical about two things that you said. One thing is that you believe that Africa is going to be the winning country. And how could it be that in a time of deglobalization, a, con a region, a continent that hadn't had the chance to converge to the income level to, of rich countries, and now with uh, the disruption of global value chains is not going to have that chance in the future as other developing countries had had in the past. So how could you expect that Africa is going to be the winner of a deglobalization era? So I can't Point, see that's this. question one. There was a second. And now comes my second okay. question. My second question is that I have, I got the impression that your picture of what globalization was doing was is very much shaped by the experience of the US, where we know that research shows that globalization has led uh, to deindustrialization, to polarization. So there are the famous author Don and Hansen papers that have shown this in the China research. shock, yeah. Yeah. So uh, okay. But this is not true for other countries. For instance, Germany. Germany has been a major winner from globalization. Germany has been a winner from the China shock. Mm. Germany has been able to face the import competition from China and expand its export to China and Eastern Europe. So trade liberalization with Eastern Europe and with China has actually benefited Germany a lot. And you can see now what happens in the era of deglobalization. Germany is suffering as uh, more than any other country. So yep. already we have that Germany lost something like two to 3% of uh, GDP per yep. percentage yep. points of GDP because of the disruption of global value chains. I'm not talking, uh, this is before Ukraine. Yeah. So it's. I think the picture is a little bit more nuanced than, than because. Uh, yeah. 
Can we, oh, so let, let's give her a chance to okay. answer. So I love those two questions, both very legitimate questions. Let me take the second first, um, and I'm gonna say something that I'm sure you're gonna disagree with. Um, I think in some ways, Germany has been the China of Europe. And I say that because Germany has benefited tremendously from the Euro, but because Europe is not the US and there has been um, not the same kind of wealth transfers, there's been a sort of a, a sucking of competitiveness that may have benefited other countries, you know, with if, if there was a different system, you might have seen Italy being a little bit more competitive relative to Germany. I think that Germany has benefited a lot, actually, um, from re re regionalization and the kind of globalization that is exemplified by the EU. I actually wrote, and I'd be happy to exchange emails with you later, I've written several papers about this. Michael Pettis, uh, a scholar at Xinhua, has also written a lot about that. I think Germany right now, and you're right, it did benefit, particularly um, post-financial crisis, Germany's model, which I actually admire quite a lot, not the financial model so much, but the um, co-determination model and, and the model by which there is a balance of power between the private sector, the public sector, and industry within companies. I think that that served Germany very well. However, I agree with you that they're now in a tough spot because as an exporter of high value industrial equipment to all kinds of countries, um, they are probably gonna have to make a, a choice between being in the sort of Chinese tech standard system or going with more of sort of a European US system. And I think that that's gonna be hard. So that's my answer to question number two. Um, in terms of question number one, and is my view too American? I would say that, and data shows this, this is in my book, the, the trends that I'm talking about apply to most OECD nations. Um, they tend to be most extreme in the Anglo-American system because I think that we bought in yeah. at, the, at the highest level to neoliberalism. And just one other thing, I didn't mean at all in, in answering your question about who the winners will be to say that I think Africa is going to do better than anybody else in the world. I was simply trying to raise the point that there are some surprising ways in which smaller countries particularly in a post-industrial era. I mean, right now, I don't think you're gonna see developing countries do the kind of Asian miracle thing again. I think that that's over. We're now in a data environment. We're in a more decentralized tech environment. I think countries like Africa could do pretty well in that environment. And that was just an example of, you know, one winner. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi there, my name's Ethan. I'm a first year student here and I'm from New Albany, Ohio, just a street away from where the new Intel plant is supposed to be built. Yeah. And I was wondering what you think it will look like within communities, especially in the United States, what the reintroduction of industry will do immediately and long term. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, uh, there's a book actually coming out um, by the head of McKinsey America called The Titanium Economy, which I would encourage you to, to get a copy of. It really dives into this question. McKinsey, of all you know, companies, is arguing that industry is going to be the favored sector of the next 20, 30, 50 years for all the reasons we're talking about, um, in part because there is this new um, conversation about the balance of, of uh, interest between national economies and global economies, in part because there is a technological tailwind to decentralized technologies that allow for more hubbing of production and consumption, which will favor industry everywhere for all kinds of reasons. So I think ultimately it's going to be a win-win, but two things have to happen. Training. You have to have labor that can work the high-tech manufacturing jobs of the future. Um, you have to have systems in which you have an understanding of, of the value of data, who owns the data, good privacy standards, good security standards. Um, that was two, but there's actually a third point that I'm, uh, uh, and, oh, and also um, productive spending, you know, I mean, I'm a little worried, I have to say, and, and one always has to be worried when you embark on major, <laughs> Um, state incentives around industrial production, you know, how much of the money is going to be productive. Uh, Bill Janeway, who's a wonderful um, venture capitalist and scholar at Cambridge, 
has a, a phrase called the productive bubble. And I really believe in this. He's done a lot of work on the topic. He says that when you have a state, a government, underwriting a path towards a new groundbreaking technology, the railroads, um, the, the computer uh, chip, the internet, and then you get the private sector coming in and commercializing it well, that is when you get broad-based periods of shared growth. And we have the potential for that now, but the details matter, right? So. So we have, thank you. We have time for one more question. Thank you. My name is Bruce Yu. I'm a second year doctoral student, PGSC. I'm research on workforce development policy. So it's great to, um, I also research associate at Wharton School. So good to see you here in James. Um, my question is really centered around workforce development policy. Then uh, I think part of the reason make Germany so successful is they have the dual system and really combine the public private partnership for companies and government policies design uh, mm. sort of a model to train their workforce. Um, also in Japan, they have uh, Shuin Kayo, which is you hire the whole graduating class yeah. that, to work for the company and, and conglomerates like Toyota. Um, do you see Japanese or American, uh, Japanese or German models can be applied to the American um, state policies and what, what potentially the public private partnership will look like between companies and state policies? Mm. Um, at the same time, what, could, what are some bottlenecks and challenges that really foresee? A great question. So I'm a huge fan of both the German and Japanese sort of Kaizen, um, you know, industrial models and the dignity of labor and the, the understanding that labor and management together in teams are what produce the best incremental innovation and ultimately the best innovation period. Um, this actually is already being applied in the US. It typically is applied in the private sector in mid-size family-owned companies and there's a lot of research on that actually in my first book i have uh there's there's a um a, i can't remember the authors now but there's like a really good 30-year study on this where they looked at big public companies and smaller private companies but kind of apples for apples in terms of products the the companies that don't have the pressure of the public market tend to uh, put double the amount of productive capex back into the um, business and in fact in my book one of the stories that i follow is in the textile industry in the carolinas which in some ways is um it, it's a very inspiring business story it's like a darwinian case study uh of how businesses can adapt so textiles in the u.s was along with furniture probably the industry that was the most decimated when china came in to the WTO because everything just went right away. What stayed were these sort of hubs of family run businesses that became in an almost Japanese or Germanic way sort of competitor collaborators. Um, they all know each other, they're highly productive, they're plowing all their profits back into training and machinery, a lot of which is built in Germany. Um, and they are doing amazing things. They actually, when the pandemic hit, nobody's buying clothes, they all stopped making t-shirts, started making masks, they drove the price of a US made mask down from 30 cents to 10 cents. Very underexplored business story. So I think that there is a lot of nimbleness in the industrial base in the US, it's just in smaller private companies. Thank you. Well, with that, it has been truly a pleasure to have this conversation. I think thank it's you. safe to say that we are all more enlightened after an hour with you. So thank you for that. Thank you for the great question. Thank you.